All right. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, April meeting of the Health Policy Commission. Um, <clears throat> we have a very full agenda today and some very important issues to discuss and some key votes to take. So I don't wanna take any more time in my introductions. I would now like to turn the uh, program over to our Deputy Executive Director, Colleen Ostermeyer, to get an approval of the minutes. Colleen? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, are there any amendments to the minutes from January 25th of this year? Seeing none, could I ask for a motion to vote on the minutes? So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, and by roll call vote, starting with you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I approve. Vice Chair Cohen. Approved. Commissioner Blakeney. Aye. Commissioner Cutler. Colleen, was this the meeting I had to miss part of? It was, yes. Do you want okay, to- So I think I should abstain solely because I missed part of the meeting. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Foley. Aye. Commissioner Haupt. Approve. Commissioner Kreider. Yep. Commissioner Master Giovanni? Aye. Under Secretary Peters? Aye. And Commissioner Roeder? Aye. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Uh, you know, it, this is uh, an important week um, which focuses our attention on Black maternal health. And I'd now like to uh, turn it back to Colleen uh, to introduce some of our staff direct uh, staff that have been focusing on this issue. Colleen. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be really brief. Along with the rest of the country, the HPC is celebrating Black Maternal Health Week this week, and I am honored to introduce Jasmine Bland to tell you more about this important recognition. Jasmine is our manager for the healthcare transformation and innovation team at the HPC, and she's currently overseeing the Beside Investment Program, which she'll, she'll tell you more about in a minute. Jasmine, take it away. Thank you, Colleen. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm really excited to have an opportunity to take a moment today to recognize Black Maternal Health Week, which runs from April 11th to 17th. So as you see on the slide, Black Maternal Health Week was established about five years ago by Black Mamas Matter Alliance, which is a national birth equity organization. And last year, the White House formally recognized Black Maternal Health Week through a proclamation issued by the Biden administration. So I'll quickly quote the Black Mamas Matter Alliance here and say that the campaign and activities for Black Maternal Health Week serve to amplify the voices of Black mamas and center the values and traditions of the reproductive and birth justice movements. Activities during Black Maternal Health Week are rooted in human rights, reproductive justice, and birth justice frameworks. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, there's a growing number of maternal health and birth equity efforts that are happening here in the Commonwealth. So I just wanna take a moment to quickly highlight a few of them that I have listed on this slide. So as Colleen mentioned, um, through the HPC, we have the BESIDE Investment Program, which stands for Birth Equity and Support Through the Inclusion of Doula Expertise. This is the newest investment program launched at the HPC. And we have two awardees, Bay State Medical Center and Boston Medical Center, who are offering doula services to black birthing people in their systems. The INSPIRE project that I have listed here is the integrating narratives of SUD treatment in the perinatal period, a focus on race and equity. And this builds on longstanding work that we've done and participated in related to substance use disorder um, and mothers and children. Uh, this is a research project that's funded by the State Opioid Response Grant. And it's a collaboration between the Health Policy Commission the Perinatal Neonatal Quality Improvement Network and Mass General. And this project really focuses on understanding the perspectives of par uh, pregnant, parenting, and postpartum people of color who are impacted by substance use disorder. Um, on the bottom right, we have the Racial Inequities in Maternal Health Commission, which was established by Chapter 348 of the Acts of 2020, an act to reduce racial inequities in maternal health. 
So this commission, which has members who are primarily people of color representing academia, government, healthcare, behavioral health, and people with lived experience and community members has concluded a statewide series of listening sessions to hear directly from folks and is in the process of developing a report due to the legislature soon. Then um, we have in the gold, uh, PINQUIN, which is the Perinatal Neonatal Quality Improvement Network again, uh, which has been collaborating with the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health Program to implement a few different maternal safety bundles across the Commonwealth. And one of the bundles that they're hoping to implement is focused on the reduction of peripartum racial and ethnic disparities. And then over to the left, um, as many of you probably know, MassHealth is planning to reimburse dual services through the 1115 waiver. And there's some collaboration with DPH involved with that. And while that's not exclusively focused on black maternal health, the provision of dual services has been a critical component of birth equity efforts. And then the last project I have here is a recent report that's been developed by the Betsy Lehman Center. And this report is really focused on doula support, again, as a, a theme of some of these topics. And the report was developed through focus groups and surveys with doulas across the Commonwealth, as well as patients who may or may not have had doula services. Um, and through uh, the report, there is a strong theme of equity and the importance of equity considerations with doulas. So again, this is just a sampling of some of the efforts. Mostly these are statewide efforts, as you can see. Um, and I also wanna take a moment to just acknowledge the advocates, people in academia, providers, black doulas, black midwives, and community members who have been doing this work and supporting black birthing people for many years. And it's really exciting to see and celebrate and be a part of all of these different emerging efforts that are building and increasing opportunities for collaboration, really in service of Black birthing people across the Commonwealth. So thank you for taking a moment to recognize Black Maternal Health Week. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, I think, I know all my commissioners know this, but one of the most, if not uh, of our uh, various activities of the Health Policy Commission is to review the, um, <clears throat> the performance of the various providers and payers in the Commonwealth with respect to, to the extent to which they are adhering to the benchmark. We call it our P PIP system. And I think my fellow commissioners are well aware that this year, uh, after careful review, we have um, asked uh, the Massachusetts uh, 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 General and the Brigham, MGB, uh, to uh, come before us because of their, the fact that their spending has been exceeding the benchmark. And our staff has been meeting with the staff of MGB to sort of determine how to move forward. So I'm now gonna ask uh, our executive director, David Sells, to fill us in on how these deliberations are going and how we should be proceeding in the forthcoming uh, weeks and months. David? Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, great to be here with you today uh, for an important meeting. So at the last board meeting on January 25th, as Chair Altman said, the board voted to require MGB to develop and file uh, a performance improvement plan. And uh, the original uh, requirement to file uh, either a proposal, a waiver, or a request for extension uh, was within 45 days or until um, March 14th. Uh, on March 14th, we did receive a request for an extension of the deadline to file its pr proposed performance improvement plan uh, to May 16th. Um, because this is an extension request that um, is longer than 45 days, it does require an approval uh, by the a vote of the board today. Um, MGB stated in their uh, request for extensions um, that they hoped to address uh, to develop a proposal that addresses spending growth for its primary care patients, 
but that also considers MGB's impact on total healthcare expenditures statewide, uh, and it would need an extension uh, to prepare such a plan. Um, the conversations have been very constructive, uh, and there is a mutual interest in a PIP proposal that will successfully address the underlying causes of MGB's cost growth and result in meaningful savings to the Commonwealth. Uh, as such, we are recommending to approve the MGB request for extension. Let me just say um, to my fellow commissioners and to the general public that I am very pleased that uh, we have had these constructive discussions with MGB. They, they, the senior staff of the organization is taking this issue very seriously. And, uh, and they do uh, plan and we expect them to come up with a very constructive set of recommendations. And um, that's why I uh, think I would very much support uh, the staff recommendations to allow MGB uh, the time to complete their um, activities. But again, I wanna reiterate that our discussions have been very positive and I am optimistic that they will come up with a plan that gets our overall spending growth uh, down closer to the benchmark, which is so important to maintain the, uh, the financial viability of our healthcare system. So I would now entertain any Further comments by my fellow commissioners? David Cutler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I too support this. When, when we first discussed this, it, as you'll, you'll recall, I was worried that we wanted to avoid the infinite loop of going around and around on things and not reaching agreement. And um, I understand from talking with David and Colleen that this is not that, that this is not a situation where they come to us, we say, no, 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 no. And it goes around infinitely and we haven't been reaching agreement, but rather this is a situation of genuine discussion and trying to help craft something that would be in the best interest of the Commonwealth. And so if that is really what's occurring and a I, I, I believe that to be the case, then I think we should take the time to allow them and us to make sure that it's correct, as opposed to rushing in. Whereas if we had thought that this was really just delay and we were not getting somewhere, then I would not have been in favor of this. But, but based on everything I know, I believe that this is appropriate. Very good. Any other comments? Yeah, I, uh, Stuart, uh, Chris, with the comment. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, it, it's great that the that the staff is uh, getting engaged. I agree with David Cutler that you know getting it right um, uh, instead of moving too fast uh, is uh, is the goal. Um, but I'd I'd also encourage the staff to push uh, with uh, MGB. Uh, the notion that this is not just about population health or prices for individual procedures. It's about the business models of hospitals, which really are broken. And uh, we are, you know, we deal with it every day. Um, and uh, the, you know, it, it, the costs are too high. Uh, patient satisfaction is too low. Quality isn't good enough. And we're, look, we're talking about a high quality place uh, in MGB. But this is, this I believe is a fundamentally, it's a contracting problem. And um, we, uh, I think we should be um, uh, uh, engaged with, with MGB on uh, how they're going to, be delivering care differently um, going forward. So that's all I wanted to say. All right, um, any other comments? Ms. Madam Secretary. 
I just make a motion to approve. Very good. There's a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All I right. think Commissioner Foley has a comment. Tim, would you like to say something before we take a final vote? No, I'm fine with taking the motion. It's more of a process question of after this is submitted, what's next in that process. So I get if this motion passes, they submit on the 16th and just wondering kind of what the next steps of that for the PIP process looks like. Dave, Dave? I can address that after the, the vote. All right, okay. let us vote and then we will explain how this will proceed. All right, so there's a motion and a second. Colleen, would you um, read the roll call, please? Absolutely, starting with you, Mr. Chairman. I approve the extension. Vice Chair Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Blakeney? Aye. Commissioner Cutler? Aye. Commissioner Foley? Aye. Commissioner Haupt? Aye. Commissioner Kreider? Yes. Commissioner Master Giovanni? Madam Secretary? Approve. And Commissioner Roeder? Aye. Thank you. All right. It, whoops. The motion is approved and we will uh, uh, alert MGB to uh, that they have the 60 days. And again, we're looking forward to a constructive uh, plan to come forward. All right, David, you wanna fill us in on how this process will play out? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner Foley, for the question. So with this approval for the request for extension, the deadline for submission of the plan is now May 16th. Uh, we actually um, have a, uh, a form uh, that we have had developed uh, many years ago uh, for a submission of a PIP proposal. The form contains a number of different information fields, including such things as a target savings estimate, uh, description of the you know, proposed interventions, timeline, um, you know, a rationale and evidence base uh, for the cost savings estimates. So there's a fair bit of material that will be included as part of uh, the form as it's submitted. Uh, we expect to, to share that with all commissioners for, um, you know, for evaluation as, as well as the staff. Um, and the next board meeting uh, after May 16th is June 8th, um, at which time if, if we feel that we're prepared, we uh, would, it would come before the board for an approval of the performance improvement plan. Um, not knowing exactly what is, is going to be proposed, um, it may take a little bit longer to evaluate, but that uh, the next board meeting after the June meeting is July 13th. Okay, very good. All right, um, we will move along and David, uh, <clears throat> I hope you will, uh, and I'm sure you will, uh, to the extent that there are activities uh, even before the final submission, I'm sure you will come before us and keep us surprised. This is a very important activity and um, uh, I'm optimistic that we'll do it right, but I wanna make sure that we do as well. All right, now we come to uh, the heart of this meeting uh, and something that is at the core of the Health Policy Commission, which is to establish uh, the benchmark spending rate for uh, calendar year 2023. Um, we've had hearings uh, where um, staff made presentations and we heard from outside sources. Uh, but I, this is a complicated issue. And uh, before we vote on the recommended benchmark, I want David Sells to take us through just what's in the law and where we are. So David, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as you said, this is uh, an important conversation for the board here today. Um, I'd like to spend just a few minutes discussing the history of the healthcare cost growth benchmark, uh, the process that is laid out in law and regulation, and uh, the decision uh, before the board today. Um, so first of all, in 2012, recognizing that the unsustainable burden of high and rising healthcare costs 
on the residents and businesses of the Commonwealth was unsustainable. The legislature enacted a comprehensive cost containment legislation, which is now a model for the country. The central fundamental organizing idea and concept in this law is the healthcare cost growth benchmark. It is a measurable target for sustainable healthcare cost growth that is tied to the long-term growth of the state's economy. The healthcare cost growth benchmark is fundamental for Massachusetts's healthcare reform journey. The goal is not just to lower costs, uh, but better health and better care for all residents. As you can see on the next slide, there is evidence that since the benchmark and CHIA uh, and HPC were established, there has been a slight moderation of the state's spending trajectory. Uh, as Massachusetts total healthcare spending growth as shown in orange here has been below national comparable rates for nearly the last decade. Um, after a previous decade where the Massachusetts rates uh, growth rates shown in orange again were much higher than the national rates. However, as you can see that gap has nearly closed in recent years as healthcare spending growth has exceeded the benchmark here in Massachusetts. And the result has been continued affordability challenges uh, for Massachusetts residents leading to foregone necessary care due to the cost of that care. On the next slide, I wanted to provide just a little bit more detail on what the benchmark is and what it isn't according to the law. Uh, the benchmark is set as a prospective target for total healthcare expenditure growth in the state and that includes both public and private payers and all types of healthcare spending, including spending at hospitals, at physician offices, uh, home health agencies, and at the pharmacy. It is not a rate cap or a price cap on individual providers, nor is, is it a limit that is indiscriminately applied. The primary mechanism for accountability for providers and health plans is the HPC's performance improvement plan process. Uh, which we previously discussed and I'll discuss a little bit more in detail on the next slide. The PIPs accountability process begins with a referral of certain entities to the HPC from CHIA based on their growth of health status adjusted total medical expenses as directed by law. Due to this requirement to use health status adjusted total medical expenses, only primary care providers with attributed primary care patients are eligible for this referral. So for example, individual hospitals are not subject to a referral based on this restriction in law. After the referral, the HPC conducts a comprehensive confidential review of the referred entities and may require a PIP if the HPC identifies significant concerns about the entity's costs and concludes that a PIP would have meaningful cost savings reforms. I really want to emphasize the thoroughness and reasonableness of, which, of this comprehensive review. And it is based on factors that are articulated in the law and in the HPC's regulation. These contextualizing factors provide guidance to the HPC to weigh additional measures of performance and market position in deciding whether a PIP is warranted for a certain provider or health plan. The next slide provides further examples of how these regulatory factors are weighed in order to ensure that the benchmark, as enforced through the PIPs process, is promoting, uh, is targeting the most concerning sources of cost growth. For example, the factors that the HPC board must consider include pricing levels and pricing growth, spending levels and trends, not just in one year, but over multiple years, the relative price of the provider, the populations it serves, including its payer mix and of public patients, the provider or health plan's financial position. All of these are factors that the HPC weighs in determining how to enforce the benchmark through the PIPs process. Additionally, and of particular note on this slide, one of the regulatory factors that the HPC takes into account is increased costs that are outside of the entity's control. I think this factor will be particularly relevant and important as the HPC considers referrals based on performance during the COVID-19 pandemic years, 
which has had significant and variable impacts on providers, health plans, and the delivery of care for the past two years. I believe that the track record of the HPC confirms that the PIPS process has been used, has not been used arbitrarily uh, to target all payers or all providers that have over benchmark spending growth. And that these factors have been critically important. Uh, and th these factors will be critically important during this period of volatility and uncertainty with regard to healthcare cost trends. So with all of that as clarifying background on the uh, benchmark history and the way that it is uh, enforced through the PIPs process, uh, let us return to the important question at hand. So on the next slide, uh, we see laid out the guardrails that are set forth in the law for the determination of setting the healthcare cost growth benchmark. As you know, for the first five years, the benchmark was established by law to be exactly equal to the long-term economic growth rate of Massachusetts as measured by a, a ter term called potential growth state product or PGSP. And that PGSP is determined annually by the legislature and the governor. So for the first five years, uh, that annual determination was that PGSP was equal to 3.6%. And so the benchmark was established at 3.6% for the first five years. In the second five years, the law allowed uh, for some flexibility, but set a default rate of the benchmark at PGSP or that economic growth rate minus half a percentage point. During this timetable as well, every year the legislature and the administration determined that PGSP was equal to 3.6%. And as such, the default rate during this time period was 3.1% every year. Uh, the board had the authority to modify that benchmark based on a two thirds vote of the board, uh, subject to a potential legislative review. However, during this entire five year period, the HPC elected not to modify the benchmark uh, and stayed with the default rate as prescribed by law. We are now in the third phase uh, of this process as laid out in the law. And here the benchmark is established by law at the default rate again of PGSP or what it was equal to for the first five years of the benchmark. The HPC does have the authority to modify to any amount, um, but that does require a two thirds vote of the board uh, and is subject to a potential legislative review. On the next slide uh, talks a little bit about that uh, potential legislative review. Again, if today the HPC board votes to maintain the benchmark at the default rate set in the law at 3.6, the annual process is complete. And if the HPC board votes to modify, uh, we must submit our intent to the joint committee, uh, which may hold a public hearing and submit recommendations to the general court. As part of the process for uh, making a recommendation on the benchmark, uh, we were required to hold a hearing, uh, which we did on March 16th. And on the next slide, you can see a summary of the positions that were submitted to the HPC through either verbal or written testimony uh, from a number of different stakeholders, uh, um, uh, associations uh, representing uh, healthcare providers, health plans, uh, businesses in Massachusetts and, um, and the residents and consumers of Massachusetts. Um, as you can see, uh, there was um, some variation in the positions recommended by these uh, different groups, uh, with some recommending uh, that the benchmark be set, uh, be modified to a lower number, um, some recommending that the benchmark be set at the default rate of 3.6, and still others recommending that the benchmark be suspended altogether. So the next slide provides just a visual of uh, what the question here before us today. Uh, the question here is to set the benchmark for calendar year 2023. So again, this is setting the benchmark for the future, um, uh, recognizing that we measure performance uh, retrospectively. Uh, so you can see here that there is still two years of data um, uh, from the pandemic that we do not yet have in terms of spending performance during 2021 or 2022. Uh, and so it, it looks to us to set this goal uh, for the future, recognizing that there is considerable um, 
uncertainty and volatility in, in these healthcare trends uh, during these years. Um, some of the witnesses at the hearing called for revisions to the law uh, to improve our cost containment approach in Massachusetts. Uh, and the HPC has already recommended and endorsed some critically important policy recommendations as contained in this year's cost trends report. Uh, time permitting, I hope to be able to return to these recommendations and remind the board, uh, the public, and uh, the legislature how important these policy reforms are to enhance and advance this overall effort to reduce spending growth. Um, but let's return to the previous slide and pause here for a conversation on the benchmark, the process, the history, uh, and uh, the future decision to set it for 2023. Well, thank you, David. So um, again, um, our task this afternoon is to make a recommendation and to, in, uh, in terms of what the benchmark would be for uh, calendar year 2023. Um, are there any comments or questions from my fellow commissioners? Let me, while you're thinking, make a few comments. Um, and I, I want to refer back to that chart that David showed, which shows overall Massachusetts is doing better since this law was put into effect than it had in the past, but that um, the gap between us and the rest of the country has narrowed. So at one level, this is not the time to take the, your foot, our foot off the brake in terms of slowing the growth in overall spending. On the other hand, um, I think, all of us understand that these last two years, 2021 and 2022, while we're in it right now, is anything but normal for all aspects of our society, particularly the healthcare system. Um, whether it's the, their needs to uh, take on added responsibilities with respect to COVID, to bring on uh, added expenses that are needed to sort of keep their hospitals high quality, um, the need to bring on new providers and the cost of wages. And we don't really know all the implications um, David has, and maybe he will make available to us, some early indicators of spending in 2021 and 22, at least at the national level, which suggests that overall spending will far exceed either 3.1 or 3.6. Is that fair to say, David? Yes, the indications are that the growth rate from the, the nadir of 2020 uh, into 2021 uh, could, will likely be significant. So, um, and probably in the orders of, well, particularly 21 coming off a minus 2.4, we could see growth rates of eight, nine, 10% because we're growing from a negative number. And even if you were to standardize it and take away that negative number, it's still going to show growth rates way exceeding 3.6 or 3.1. And, and early indications are we could see the same thing for 2022. So as I've been thinking about this and talking to many of you and uh, trying to read whatever I can, about it, I came away with two conclusions and I would welcome my fellow commissioners from making comments as well. 
on the one hand, as I said, we cannot take our foot off the brake and we need to continue to slow the growth in spending if we are going to have a healthcare system which is affordable for all of our citizens. But we also can't be unmindful of these currents which are not normal uh, in any stretch of the imagination nor do we want to shortchange our health system as it copes with these problems. <clears throat> Therefore, I am of the opinion that we maintain our strong commitment to cost containment, but we do it in a reasonable way and that we maintain what the law establishes as the, as the core rate of 3.6%, recognizing that the rest of the country is likely to show growth rates significantly above that. But again, keeping our foot on the brake without pushing it so hard that it would do harm to our healthcare system. I guess that's where I'm coming out and I would Welcome any additional comments by my fellow commissioners. David Cutler. Uh, thank you. So I, I have a, a few comments, um, less about the specific number here and more about other related matters. One is, um, the year-to-year -year growth rate, I think, is going to be a very difficult number to interpret for the past couple of years and potentially for next year because of exactly what's been mentioned, which is what's going on with COVID. So, you know, in 2020, in 2019, spending was down in 2020, or 2020 was down in 2021. It'll be up a lot in 2022. Who knows where it's going to be, depending on what happens with COVID the rest of the year and catching up of care and so on. And then to think about in 2023, you know, it's very difficult to know. So I think we're, I think of necessity, we're going to have to look over several years worth of average growth rates as opposed to growth rates in a single year. And I think when we get the data from GIA, particularly for any data starting any data, including 2020, I think we should be looking at multiple years worth of data as opposed to a single year worth of data as we do that. Um, so that's one, one uh, issue. I think the second issue is that um, the, the in, I think the inflation, the overall inflation rate being so high really puts um, a lot of stress on healthcare and a lot of tension associated with this. Um, you know, inflation is now running at seven or eight percent. It's likely to moderate some, but it's still going to be above the two percent that was sort of built into the kind of forecasting equation. And I think what that does is that Primarily, it makes it difficult for healthcare organizations to hire workers because when mm -hmm. prices are going up, wages are going up as well. And so a lot of organizations have had to increase what they pay this year and will probably have to continue to increase what they pay next year. I don't know how that's trickling through. So in most of American industry, when costs go up, prices go up. But here, the prices are fixed in advance for at least some period of time based on contracts. So what I'm nervous about is that the input costs are going up for a lot of organizations and the, the prices are not yet. And so they're gonna be losing money. Um, and then they're going to come into negotiations for 2023 or 2024 saying we lost a lot of money, we need a price increase. I think for some organizations that's probably justified so for some organizations that have been on the lower end of rate increases and are on the lower end of the scale of prices, well, I think all of them, all organizations could have done better to reduce excessive spending 
I think some organizations have a better claim to um, uh, saying that they need a, some allowance for the price increase than others. And I think other organizations, even though it will hit them a lot, particularly the higher priced organizations and the ones whose spending have increased the most, I think are in less of a good situation to um, ask for it and, and, less, and, le and less need for the Commonwealth to think about granting that. So if we had the authority to do so, which I, I understand we do not, if we had the authority to do so, my recommendation would have been to think about having two types, having a, a, a benchmark, which was split between those providers that have traditionally been very well paid mm -hmm. and have had rapid increases in uh, TME and rapid increases in spending, at least on a dollar basis over time, and those that have not, and to think about being looser with the, with the ones that have been less well paid and that have had lower increases than the ones that have been more favored. Um, I don't think we can do that, but I think the, then my alternative view is whatever the target is, whether it's 3.1 or 3.6 or whatever, we should be very clear that it is not our intention to force organizations to go bankrupt because their costs have risen in, in the pandemic and that um, some leniency on some circumstances may be appropriate but that's going to vary depending on the type of institution. And that is not going to be the case for institutions that have traditionally been very highly paid and that have had large increases and in the rest that those seeing that is going to make us um, not comfortable, but seeing it in other organizations, perhaps on a temporary basis where that organization might otherwise be, think, be in the midst of taking a really bad turn is something, again, particularly if it's temporary to respond to the particular wage uh, and to some extent input cost increase here is something that we can understand and that when it comes time to think about performance improvement plans, we would be able to take that into account. So, 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 so that said, I, I'll kind of look, my intention is to look over a period of time and to look at the institution to be somewhat more flexible, particularly on those institutions that have not done so well, um, not being not throwing things out, but being a little more flexible, but maintaining our strict rigor with respect to those organizations that have done much better and that we believe should be able to continue to reduce costs even as their input costs are going up a lot. Well, I want to uh, thank you, David. That was very thoughtful. Um, I do want to remind my commissioners that in, in establishing a PIP, uh, the staff does in fact look at the many different criteria in terms of how our organization has performed and where it is and so on. So we are very mindful of what you indicated and, um, and I more than assume I'm counting on the idea that the staff will continue to do that as they look at spending growth relative to the benchmark. But I appreciate your comments, David Cutler, very much. Other questions or comments anybody from the commission would like to make? If I don't hear anything, um, I would like to make a motion uh, that the benchmark for 2023 be at 3.6%. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. I hear a second. Um, uh, Colleen, would you read the roll call? Yes, starting with you, Mr. Chairman. I support the recommendation. Okay, Vice Chair Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Blakeney. Reluctantly, aye. Commissioner Cutler. Aye. Commissioner Foley. Aye. Commissioner Haupt. Aye. Aye. 
Thank you. Commissioner Kreider. Aye. Commissioner Master Giovanni. Aye. Secretary Sutters. Aye. Commissioner Roeder. Aye. Thank you. I gather from that that it is unanimous that the motion has been approved and we will we will uh, subject to a review by the legislature. Uh, we will establish the benchmark from 2023 at 3.6%. Thank you very much. And let me now turn the program back over to David Sells. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I did want to spend just a few minutes reflecting on uh, our cost trends report recommendations because I do think they are an important part of this conversation and a, and a real reflection of this board's strong commitment to healthcare cost containment, affordability, and health equity. Uh, that was really the crux of our policy recommendations this year, is how we can move these three things forward. And I think um, acti legislative activity to help advance some of these recommendations will put the Commonwealth in a much stronger position to be able to reflect some of the challenges uh, that were, we, we discussed today. So as we approach this 10-year anniversary of the HPC and the establishment of this law, it's, it's a great opportunity to reflect on what has worked, maybe what hasn't, what can be improved on, and the lessons learned. I would also say I believe that this is a really unique moment as well as the Speaker, the Senate President, and the Governor have all been advocating for healthcare policy reforms this session. Uh, the House and Senate have already passed important bills and a hearing on the comprehensive bill filed by Governor Baker was held just earlier this week. Uh, these recommendations in our cost friends reports are, are really complementary uh, to these efforts. Uh, the first I just wanna highlight is strengthening accountability for excessive spending on the next slide and the need for greater uh, flexibility in the metrics used in the referral process and the potential inclusion of, of financial penalties. Uh, on the next slide, um, you can see that uh, if there was more flexibility in the referral process, that may have a number of significant benefits, including the ability to uh, have other provider types uh, be included within the accountability structure of the benchmark. Importantly, to Professor Cutler's uh, point earlier, uh, more flexibility here could allow CHIA to base its referrals on a broader range of metrics than just growth and health status adjusted TME that, that may be better able to capture the baseline size, spending, or price levels of providers. And I note here that there could potentially be a higher bar for referrals for smaller, lower price providers or lower spend entities. Additionally, the inclusion of financial penalties may be a stronger deterrent than the, a PIP alone. Um, and I would note that Oregon and the establishment of their healthcare cost growth benchmark did include the concept of financial penalties. Uh, the funds uh, that could be collected from these penalties could be used uh, for a broad range of improvement activities or to help support those providers again that take care for a larger share of publicly insured patients. The second recommendation I wanted to highlight again um, is around really addressing uh, the primary driver of healthcare spending in the Commonwealth, which is provider pricing. Uh, a recent CBO study found that Massachusetts had the highest commercial prices for hospital inpatient services of any state in the country. Uh, the reforms recommended here would mitigate the impact of excessive provider pricing while creating the opportunity for greater pricing growth in lower price providers, such as many community hospitals, and that often care for underserved communities, thus promoting health equity. Uh, the next slide here uh, just provide some examples of how other states are already leading the way in more directly addressing pricing as part of their cost containment strategies. And then finally, on the next slide, there are two other complementary recommendations that I wanted to highlight again uh, to improve this process. One is ensuring uh, through the Division of Insurance that the sa any savings gathered here are truly passed on to consumers and that we make real improvements in the affordability of care as felt by residents through their premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. And second, 
uh, that as part of this benchmark process and cost containment process, we should be shifting funding to high value services such as primary care and behavioral health care. Uh, this is a hallmark and centerpiece of Governor Baker's bill and is very complementary with all of these uh, reform efforts. Uh, finally, taken together, action on these recommendations on the next slide will show, will improve and advance our efforts in numerous ways by focusing accountability on the entities most responsible for unwarranted spending growth, addressing unwarranted price variation, helping the, ensure the viability of lower price providers, advancing affordability for our residents, and shifting healthcare resources over time to high value services such as primary care and behavioral health care. So we continue to look forward to working with the administration and the, and the legislature on these important reforms uh, in the weeks and months to come. Uh, and thank you for that opportunity to just talk through these recommendations again. David, thank you so much. And I'm so glad you did that because um, you know, we could lose sight of these recommendations um, with the uh, complexity of deciding um, what the benchmark should be and what, how we um, implement the performance improvement plans and so on. But it's important for us periodically to go back to these recommendations and to continue to push hard that they be looked at seriously by the key policymakers of the Commonwealth. Are there any uh, discussions anybody from our fellow my fellow commissioners would like to make? Uh, David Cutler? Yeah, I apologize. I keep cutting in, but I just feel like I want to ask questions on so many things from my comments. So we have obviously have very strong relationships with um, members of the Baker Polito administration. I was wondering, David or Colleen, if you could talk about working with members of the legislature in terms of how, how I know we, 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 of course, appear with them in our uh, cost trends, you know, benchmark hearings and stuff, but what can we do to help make sure that these recommendations are given full consideration that they make their way to the relevant members of the committees to the committee staff and, and, and so on. Because based on comments that I've read in the Globe and elsewhere, there is a lot of energy into tackling some of these issues now. And so I think now would be a very good time for us to continue to, 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 to step up our efforts to, to push some of these topics. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cutler. As I said, I believe that this is really a unique moment. We have incredible thought leaders at really important positions uh, across Beacon Hill. Uh, Representative Chairman Lawn, Chairman Friedman, who chair the Joint Healthcare Financing Committee, uh, the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, all have expressed commitment to healthcare reform and are deeply knowledgeable uh, about healthcare policy uh, complexities. And, and we have, um, I think, been uh, a resource uh, I hope to them and will continue to be as they are, are really thoughtfully considering the necessary reform. So I do believe this is a unique opportunity with incredible leadership uh, in the administration and on Beacon Hill. The only thing I would add, David, is when we submit the board's decision to set the benchmark at 3.6% for 2023, we submit it formally to the legislature, to the Joint Committees on Healthcare Financing. So with that, this year, we will also resubmit the policy recommendations that the board voted on and that David just discussed. So in a formal sense, we will submit that again to the legislature, in addition to everything David just said that we do behind the scenes. When does the legislative session end this year? Do you... Um, so uh, formal sessions end on July 31st, um, and informal sessions uh, continue uh, uh, through the end of the calendar year, essentially. So, but we we would, but the legislature would need to pass these before the end of July, right? Yes. Secretary Sutters, I saw you. <laughs> yes, um, I would say major policy reforms would need to occur by the end of July. There's always the opportunity during the informal sessions, but it's um, but it is, it is more complicated. So we should maybe think about what 
we should do in the next month or two so that there's what if there is going to be a healthcare package voted upon that it has these recommendations at least considered you know at least that, that it was sort of like clear an up or down decision was made yes we want to include these or no we don't want to include these i so if i may stuart sure so what I'd say, um, Professor Cutler, is that um, as Colleen indicated, like the vote, um, I think the document, the formal document that is provided by HPC and Colleen and David can go into the detail because I don't, I don't, I certainly don't look at it, is like the formal statements of the HPC. Um, and I think the fact that it's a complete document that goes across the street, not just the vote, but uh, these recommendations really give the HPC sort of position for the legislature to uh, consider as they um, deliberate. And they, of course, I'm sure, again, David and Colleen can speak to this um, since I have a distinct role in this, uh, provide expert information um, about the details of all these things, but I would defer to the staff on the communication. I think it's, I would say it's active. I, yes. The, uh, the legislature knows us well, and as the secretary pointed out, uh, they have uh, periodically come and asked for additional information but it's not in our um, either best interest or in the best interest of the process for us to keep telling them the same thing. They understand where we're coming from. And I appreciate what Colleen said. And that is that in addition to the 3.6, we will be sending these up again. Tim, I know you had your hand up. Would you like to say something? I, I think uh, Secretary Sun is going to uh, hit where I was going to hit, which is I, I, I think particularly in the context of setting the benchmark, um, that setting the policy recommendations to go along with it and the communication to the legislature is really an appropriate way to communicate um, what we believe as a commission or some of the policy changes and tools that we need as a commission to strengthen the role of the HPC and to really focus in on where the real spending issues are. I think Professor Cutler mentioned it earlier, just about uh, the impact of this benchmark on those that the have and the have nots in the system. And really we need to be able to focus in on the, the, the folks in the industry that are having a bigger impact than others on our growth benchmark and be much more targeted in our approach. And I think it was helpful at the beginning of the conversation for David Zeltz to outline kind of how the PIP process um, it plays out and how to, what factors we take into consideration when thinking about what action to take as it relates to excessive spending above benchmark. Um, and that's one tool that we have, but clearly, you know, the statute's pretty clear about what role and what we can do around um, the benchmark. And so I think, you know, making clear to the legislature through that communication about some of the areas that we believe need to be changed in order for us to be much more targeted in our approaches, exactly what we should be doing. Um, and hopefully there'll be action taken on that. As we know, this is an important um, evolving <laughs> tool that we should uh, make sure is really uh, utilized the most appropriately to ensure that we control costs in the areas that we need to. And not all spending is the same in this market. And I think we need a benchmark that reflects that both on the payer and the provider side, but also I think we've highlighted in our policy recommendations on trying to set a target for consumer spending. Um, let's, I don't want to lose sight of that as well, but I think of the context of the benchmark, the communication around these policy recommendations makes a lot of sense. And I know the legislature um, pays attention to what the HPC has to say generally, but in particular around policy recommendations to improve the role that we have to play as a watchdog in this industry. So I think it makes a lot of sense in support um, being clear in our communication of what recommendations we have around improving uh, the role of the HPC. All right, well, this is very good. And I appreciate David Seltz, you're bringing this up again. Obviously, uh, the healthcare system in Massachusetts is not standing still. And um, I'd like to get a sense of the various market forces that have been changing uh, since our last meeting. So David, you wanna introduce that and have some of our staff fill us in? 
Great, thank you. Yeah, so just want to provide our, our standard update on, on a high degree of, of uh, high level of uh, market changes. Uh, excuse me, Madam Secretary. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to, since we're doing this virtually, I don't know how to do this anymore. I used to just like politely get up and move off the, uh, the uh, dais, but I'm going to have to um, step out and yield my chair to the undersecretary. So um, my apologies for interrupting, but uh, I just want to. We appreciate your taking the time in these messy times. And I know there's a lot of on your plate. So thank you for joining us. And uh, we always. It's, right. it's, budget, it's budget day from the house. So right. I, will, I will yield to that. Take care, everybody. All right. Thank you, Madam Secretary. So um, just teeing up uh, uh, that there has been uh, a high number of market changes and notices to the HPC uh, in the recent months. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Sasha hayes Rusnoff, who's gonna give us an update on a number of those uh, market changes, both that we have already reviewed and that are still under review. Thank you, Director Seltz. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon to everyone uh, watching remotely. Um, since we began tracking market changes in 2013, the Health Policy Commission has reviewed a total of 140 provider transactions. Uh, as you can see here, formations of contracting entities uh, being the most frequent, followed by physician group affiliations and then clinical affiliations among provider entities. Uh, on the next slide, as Director Zaltz mentioned, uh, we've had uh, a actually an unprecedented number of notices under review uh, since our last board meeting. Uh, we've elected to not proceed to a cost and market impact review on six provider transactions. I'm gonna run through these briefly. Uh, please do uh, raise hands or just cut in if you have uh, additional questions. Um, first, a proposed joint venture between a holding company that was formed by Beth Israel Hospital Plymouth uh, and Pilgrim ASC to own and operate a freestanding ambulatory surgery center. Uh, Pilgrim is composed of physicians that perform um, uh, orthopedic surgery at BID Plymouth. They're members of the Plymouth Bay Orthopedic Associates, and those physicians would staff the new ASC. In our preliminary examination, we found limited scope for spending or market impacts from the transaction. Uh, the physicians already contract through BILH and the freestanding AIC rates are expected to be lower than the rates at BID Plymouth and other local hospitals. Uh, BID Plymouth's outpatient prices are uh, relatively low compared to other local hospitals. And that suggests that a backfill of surgical cases that might move to the ASC is unlikely to significantly impact spending. And we did not review evidence uh, suggesting that the transaction is likely to negatively impact uh, quality or access to care. Second transaction uh, was a proposed clinical affiliation between Atrius Health and South Shore Hospital. Under the transaction, South Shore would become a designated preferred hospital for Atrius patients. Uh, South Shore would provide a discount to Atrius patients for certain services, and uh, the parties would work together to collaborate on care coordination uh, and quality measures. In our preliminary examination here too, we found limited scope for spending and market impacts. Satchel Hospital does have uh, higher relative prices compared to some other local hospitals, uh, but if the party's plans for care coordination uh, for Atrius patients at South Shore uh, are successful, uh, they could lead to some uh, quality improvement and potentially reduction in spending for shared patients if uh, there are some avoided admissions and readmissions. Third, Commissioner oh, uh, Foley. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt in the middle, but you said interrupt no, in the middle, please. I guess I could have. Uh, just going back to the top one, I was yeah. just thinking, I, I know there were a lot of uh, conditions put in place around the B.I. Leahy merger. Uh, I'm wondering, does any of that apply to this or is there any uh, conditions applied to for this type of outpatient services? Or I'm just wondering, is there any interaction at all or how that might, uh, with this type of transaction for B.I. Leahy? That's an excellent question. Uh, and 
To be honest, I, I do not know the answer off the top of my head. That is certainly something that, that we can consider further. Obviously, the Attorney General's office is uh, the entity responsible for uh, primarily for enforcing uh, and monitoring the conditions of the BILH merger. So I'm sure that uh, her office has, has taken note of this, uh, but I don't know exactly how uh, the interaction with the new joint venture would work here. Thank you. Sasha, um, with respect to Atreus and South Shore, um, th uh, does this preclude Atreus from entering into clinical affiliations with other hospitals? I know uh, they've always had a strong relationship with the Beth Israel. Does that continue or is this a s substitute? No, th this is, uh, our understanding is that this is a new relationship that is not supplanting existing relationships. Uh, and indeed, on a later slide, you'll see that Atreus is also um, proposing to enter into a, a preferred relationship with Emerson Hospital. It seems that, that Atreus is expanding its network to our knowledge that this doesn't supplant any existing clinical relationships, that those will all continue. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Third item uh, is a proposed transaction where Spire Orthopedic Partners, which is a Delaware-based for-profit management services organization, uh, is acquiring the non-clinical assets of uh, and providing administrative services to Sports Medicine North Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, Sports Medicine North is a physician group practice that provides orthopedic surgery, surgery services and physical therapy to uh, North Shore patients. Uh, in connection with the transaction, there is an ASC that is owned collectively by Sports Medicine North Physicians that would be uh, become a wholly owned subsidiary uh, managed by Spire. Uh, following the transaction, Sports Medicine would continue to employ its physicians and other clinicians continue to contract with payers uh, and maintain its existing operations. It would just be affiliated with Spire with management services provided by the Spire entity. Uh, in our examination here too, we found limited uh, scope for potential market and spending impacts. Uh, there are no expected changes to payer contracting as a result of the transaction, uh, no plan changes in services, clinical relationships would all remain in place. Uh, it was really uh, a switch out for um, the Spire providing management services and, and taking on, uh, taking on the, the management of facilities. Uh, we also found no evidence that it's likely to negatively impact clinical quality or access to care. Fourth slide a proposed joint venture between some holding companies formed by New England Baptist Hospital, uh, a group of New England Baptist surgeons, and Constitution Surgery Alliance, which is a subsidiary of a uh, surgical center management and development company uh, called Constitution Sur Surgery Alliance. Uh, the joint venture that these entities are planning to form would take ownership of an existing New England Baptist hospital licensed ASC that's located in Dedham, and it would be converted from a hospital-based site to a freestanding ASC. Uh, so members of the, uh, the joint venture would be the hospital, the surgeons that perform uh, the surgeries there, and uh, this management services organization. And the surgeons involved are the folks who are already on part of uh, Baptist surgery uh, physician team. Uh, Beth Israel Leahy Health already negotiates payer contracts on behalf of both Baptists and the physicians. Uh, services at the ASC uh, would be billed at freestanding ASC rates, uh, which are expected to be lower than the current New England Baptist outpatient department rates. And given Baptists generally low relative prices, backfill of any cases that move to the ASC are unlikely to significantly impact spending. Uh, and here too, because there are no expected actual changes in services, we don't see uh, a potential for negative impacts on quality or access to care. Moving to the next slide, two more. Uh, fifth transaction was uh, a contracting affiliation between South Shore Health Integrated Delivery Network, 
which is the successor organization to South Shore PHO and Compass Medical PC, uh, which is a group that provides primary care, urgent care, and specialty care uh, in southeastern Massachusetts, about 100 uh, providers. Uh, and under the transaction, Compass would join uh, South Shore IDN as, uh, as a participating physician group, leaving uh, their contracting arrangement with Steward Healthcare. Uh, we did not, we found limited scope for spending and market impacts uh, from this transaction. Uh, South Shore IDN has lower uh, physician relative prices and TME than Compass's current contracting network. Uh, we don't expect significant impacts on spending based on changes in referral patterns. Uh, and we didn't review uh, evidence that the transaction is likely to negatively impact uh, quality or access to care. And finally, uh, proposed clinical affiliation between BILH and Cape Cod Healthcare, uh, under which uh, the parties would jointly provide clinical services and recruit primary care providers in Cape Cod service area and enter into a preferred provider relationship. Uh, the affiliation would include BILH replacing some mass general uh, hospitals in providing specialist hospital services at Cape Cod. Uh, the transaction does not involve Cape Cod joining BILH as a corporate or contracting affiliate, so there's limited scope for uh, impacts on market leverage or prices. Uh, BILH hospital prices uh, are generally lower compared to Mass General Brigham, so any potential impacts on referral patterns are unlikely to increase prices. Uh, and we didn't see any potential evidence for uh, impacts on quality or access to care. So those are the transactions uh, on which we have elected not to conduct a cost and market impact review. We have four transactions currently under review. Uh, those are a proposed uh, joint venture among Signature Healthcare, South Shore you, Health. Uh, hold on for a second. Please, yes. I just want to make sure that um, there's no disagreement among the commissioners about all the proposals that we are not going to follow any further. Having heard no comments, Sasha, continue on. Thank you. Um, so as I said, a joint venture among Signature, South Shore, Sturdy Memorial, uh, along with uh, Southeast Massachusetts Behavioral Health, uh, which is a subsidiary of the national uh, firm US Health Vest, uh, to develop a new psychiatric hospital in Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, there is also uh, a proposed affiliation, a clinical affiliation between Lawrence General Hospital and Steward Healthcare, uh, under which uh, they would collaborate on uh, providing services at Lawrence General Hospital and uh, engage in joint contracting for Medicare managed care patients. A proposed clinical affiliation between Atrius Health and Emerson, as I mentioned, uh, where Emerson would become a preferred hospital for Atrius patients. And uh, the proposed acquisition of Franciscan Children's Hospital, which is a specialty pediatric Catholic aligned uh, hospital that focuses on uh, chronic care and mental health and rehab services uh, by Boston Children's, uh, well, Children's Medical Center Corporation, which is the parent corporation of Boston Children's Hospital. Um, I'll note that that acquisition is uh, subject to both our MCN review process, as well as uh, DPH's determination of need uh, review process. Uh, the DON application has been submitted as well, uh, and we're working on review of, of this, as well as the other three uh, proposed material changes right now. Uh, and we look forward to providing you updates on these as we continue our reviews. I'll pause for a moment. Uh, there are, uh, starting with our, our next slide though, several other market changes going on in addition to the proposed children's uh, Franciscan acquisition uh, that involve the pediatric provider market. And we wanted to update you on just a couple of those. Um, oh. Hold on a second, yeah, let's terrible. make sure that, um, are there any comments so far on the, 
on the, the activities that Sasha has just gone through. Okay. So as you pointed out, there is a number of activities going on in the children's healthcare systems. So yeah, it, indeed, there is the the proposed uh, acquisition of Franciscan Children's Hospital, as I just mentioned. Uh, last year, Children's also uh, submitted a determination of need to expand ambulatory sites uh, outside of Boston. Uh, that includes uh, expanding and renovating the existing children's Waltham satellite campus uh, with some new specialty services, uh, including adding a uh, medical psychiatric partial hospitalization program, uh, building a new multi-specialty site in Needham, including an eight operating room uh, suite uh, and an MR, adding an MR unit. Uh, and leasing and building out a new multi-specialty site in Weymouth, uh, including one MRI unit, uh, some of which is consolidating existing children's services in that area. Uh, the project would, is, the, the price tag uh, is an expected $435 million. The children states uh, that the goal of the project is to expand capacity and coordinate care uh, and consolidate some existing services in new space. They've also highlighted that uh, the satellites for children's receive lower reimbursement rates than its main campus for certain services. Uh, in our review of the materials uh, that Children's has filed with the DON program so far, uh, we are, are closely reviewing everything. We've identified a few open questions, uh, including about the exact volume of expanded services uh, for each of these locations and uh, some questions about which services and locations would receive hospital facility rates as opposed to freestanding or clinic-based reimbursement rates from payers. Uh, it's our understanding that additional information uh, may be being provided by children's to the DON program. So we look forward to reviewing uh, that when it's available. Uh, additionally, the DON program has held a hearing, uh, held it back in uh, December, uh, on this project and uh, are requiring children's to uh, undergo an independent cost analysis of the project. Uh, that has been underway for some time. Uh, we do not know exactly what the contractor's timeline will be. Uh, so we are looking closely at this. Uh, welcome any comments or questions. There is one other uh, change in the pediatric space that I want to cover, but uh, Commissioner Foley. Yes, um, just a question. What, what is the, I know we've commented in the past, there's an opportunity for the HBC to comment on the determination need. So at what point would we um, make that determination? So the, uh, our next opportunity for comment under the DON regs uh, will be after the independent cost analysis is accepted by the department. We will have 30 days uh, thereafter to provide comment. Uh, after that point, uh, our, our other opportunity for comment comes uh, once D the DON program has developed its staff reports. And you know, our, our thinking has been that it is most helpful for us to comment uh, in response to, to ICA so that the program staff have sufficient time to, to consider any comments that we have uh, well in advance of the Public Health Council meeting. Do we have any sense of when that ICA would be ready? Uh, it, it's unclear as of now, uh, the, uh, as I say, the, the, um, it's been underway for some time, but, you know, they have to, the, the contractor has to get CHIA data and then conduct analyses. We're not exactly sure when we're expecting that. Barbara. Thank you, Stuart. Sasha, thank you. It's a, it's a great review. A couple of questions. <clears throat> Do we know or can we obtain information throughout the state that shows us where pediatric inpatient beds currently exist? And would we also know the uh, inpatient psychiatric, pediatric and um, um, adolescent beds? I'm asking because I'm, I'm thinking in terms of a repeating process for places such as Tufts with maybe a 40 bed unit may not have the critical mass 
to maintain those beds and especially maintain those, uh, those specialties that support the inpatient. Um, but looking across the state, is this going to be a recurring pattern where what we end up with is one or maybe two uh, large facilities um, pulling uh, children and parents away from their communities to get the care that's needed. Uh, how do we think about that? How do we proactively um, recommend and think about modeling, for example, regional models? What can we do uh, in our capacity to begin the process of, of helping the state recognize an emerging pattern and a pattern that I, for one, don't think is, is particularly healthy or helpful? That's that's a great question. I I think that the um, the data with regard the information about you know what capacity exists where with regard to inpatient care uh, exists uh, and and can be compiled and indeed um, we've we've been working on that both uh, in thinking about the current pediatric market changes as well as uh, sort of the health system more generally recently. Um, I think that outpatient care is slightly more of a challenge because the you know outpatient sites are not necessarily as well uh, inventoried by the state. Uh, so we are working to do our best with that as well. I'll also note that um, there are, uh, in addition to sort of concentration of beds, there is also the fact that uh, staffing even at community hospitals in many cases is being provided by uh, staff from uh, the uh, the major medical centers, including Tufts Children's and, and Mass General Hospital. Um, so it's not only a question of uh, physical bed capacity, but also centralization of uh, sort of staffing networks as well. So Sasha, let me uh, state, with, um, which I know you know, and your team knows very well, um, with respect to children's expansion in the community, two things. One, you know, it's still very close, uh, very much in my mind <clears throat> when children's asked for and got a substantial increase in their bed capacity in their main hospital several years ago, we asked them to do a whole bunch of things. And of course, uh, and we were very concerned about the extra beds that it was gonna add costs. They indicated strongly that they thought a lot of these children would be coming from other parts of the country, if not other parts of the world. If it turns out that these increases are what many of us suspected mostly coming from Massachusetts, they will add substantially to costs. Then we get the second issue is that they're making the comment that the expansion in Needham and Waltham and Weymouth would lower the cost relative to what is being uh, charged in the uh, main facility. But the issue there here is just what we just went through with Mass General Brigham. To what extent are these patient children uh, gonna come from other uh, outpatient facilities uh, in other, which are substantially lower cost since children's has among the highest prices in the Commonwealth. All I am saying is stuff that you already know, I'm sure, but we need to get a as in-depth understanding of this very these various growths as we did with respect to Mass General Brigham. So I'm looking forward to us doing the kind of excellent work that we've done in the past. We are we are working to put all of those analyses uh, together and to to really thoroughly examine those questions. And obviously, uh, our, our partners at uh, DPH are are doing the same in their DON review. Very good, thank you. Any other questions or comment? Any more on your part, Sasha? Uh, Stuart, I have a question. Yes, sure. Chris. Uh, uh, Sasha, uh, could you uh, amplify a little bit on the Franciscan, the proposed Franciscan transaction? 
Uh, certainly, the um, Children's Medical Center Corporation has has proposed to acquire Franciscan uh, in, in its entirety. Uh, my understanding is that they have their uh, going through a process with the, the Catholic Church to get approvals for that on their end. Uh, the acquisition requires uh, a new facility licensure process uh, that requires a determination of need, review, and approval. Um, and uh, Franciscan uh, would join uh, Children's Hospital in the, the Children's Network uh, as uh, a corporate uh, a part of that that corporate structure. Um, there are also uh, contemplated investments uh, by children's in capital spending uh, at Franciscan. Our, our read through of the materials available so far suggests that the, the primary goal is to uh, continue services uh, at Franciscan uh, substantially as, as they exist currently. So by that, you mean continue acute care services um, in particular? Uh, the, continue the services that, that Franciscan Hospital provides, yeah. How many, Do beds? You have a specific... How many beds are there? I will have to look at my notes for that. Okay, but a small number, 30 to 50, something like that. And my the, apologies, I don't have that on my the children's in, intention. It is to keep the acute care facilities going. Yes, that is that is correct. And, and when what's what sort of timetable are, are we looking at there? So the uh, the dealing process, as you know, uh, is a four to six month process uh, for DON approval. I, I think that we don't have a great sense of. Uh, what timetable uh, they're on for approval from uh, from the Catholic Church to to condone the transaction? How long ago was it filed? Uh, it was filed uh, just at the uh, beginning of this month. Okay. I mean, to, to Barbara's point, you know, this is a um, sorry. This, this is a consolidation of the highest order, um, and um, it's a it's a very uh, it's a very complicated policy question. I uh, wonder if we can look to other cities to understand what's happened uh, with children's consolidations. Uh, uh, Cincinnati comes to mind, a, a preeminent children's hospital where I know there's been an enormous amount of consolidation. So, but, you know, not the New Yorks and the LAs and the Chicagos, but the the, the mid-sized cities that have, uh, have faced this um, have... Uh, probably some data now that we can draw from. Absolutely. And, and this obviously presents, uh, the, the, the question here is, is also about what happens when specialty focused hospitals are incorporated into a system uh, as well as, as Franciscan really is focused on behavioral health and chronic care. Um, which Children's Hospital obviously does some of, but Franciscans being a focused facility. Stuart, if I could. Yes, please. I just to, just to follow up, I, I know that we don't have <clears throat> a regulatory ability to do this, <clears throat> but Part of my hope would be that as we continue to look at the issue around children's services, that we try to figure out, is there a way or can we create a way where behavioral health services must be somehow supported in any additional mergers and or acquisitions? How do we, the, the, the ability to provide inpatient pediatric and adolescent services is woefully uh, under supported. Um, and it's a difficult service to provide. How do we explore or how do we encourage the exploration of <clears throat> pairing some of that going forward? I don't know how you do it. I just think that we should somehow be encouraging that, that conversation and encouraging that movement. 
Thank you. Absolutely. And, and I will say that we know that that is a, f a focus on pediatric behavioral health services is very much top of mind for our colleagues at the Department of Mental Health right now as well, and that that's been a major focus of theirs recently. Okay. Uh, Sasha, are you, uh, are you complete? Uh, I, I see that uh, Commissioner Cutler has his hand up. Oh, Sorry, I didn't see that. Um, Sasha, one of the things that I would find really helpful would be, you remember the chart that you made for MGB about what were the trends in utilization of hospital services and you know what had been going on and so on? I would love to see a similar thing for children's hospital capacity. That is, is it the situation that we thankfully have too many inpatient beds for children relative to what's needed? Um, or is it the case that, you know, we don't, and what this is reflecting is sort of differential market power and, um, uh, and, and the consequences that flow from that. And to Barbara's point, I think it might be helpful, and maybe we should have done this with MGB, I think it might be helpful to break apart the utilization into behavioral health and non-behavioral health. Um, causes because it may be that we have too many of one type and not enough of another type and I wouldn't want that to get lost. Absolutely, we will. Uh, we can pull those numbers without a doubt. Uh, I, I want to circle back, uh, Commissioner Kreider, it's 81 beds at uh, Franciscan Children's Hospital and the notice was filed my, my error on March 21st uh, as opposed to the beginning of April. Uh, we do have one more slide on uh, outlining some items on uh, the proposed closure of uh, the Tufts Medical Center pediatric beds. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, folks to, to cut in here if we think we don't have time for this discussion. Uh, I will try to be brief. Uh, as you know, the plan is to close, that is that Tufts Medical Center will close its 41 uh, pediatric inpatient beds on July 1st and convert those to adult beds. Uh, Tufts has said it's going to maintain its neonatal ICU, pediatric emergency department, outpatient services, and the staffing that it does at its affiliated community hospitals. Uh, it's also stated that it has a letter of intent with Boston Children's Hospital to provide continuity of care for inpatients. Uh, this change is being reviewed by DPH under the essential services uh, closure review process. Tufts has filed a 90-day notice of intent. Uh, our expectation is under the DPH process, they're going to hold a public hearing. Uh, Tufts is going to be required to submit a more detailed uh, notice 60 days at least ahead of time. Uh, and that usually includes uh, a more detailed plan for continuity of care for uh, patients. Uh, I'll note that we're not aware of the exact nature of the letter of intent between Tufts and Children's. Uh, a new affiliation between the two of them would likely also require an MCN notice. And that of course would have to be filed at least 60 days prior to uh, a proposed transaction date. And that would include, uh, that, that would be necessary uh, if there's an established preferred provider relationship, substantial cross-staffing, co-branding, or a transition of Tufts physicians to uh, the children's network in a sufficiently large number. Uh, so we are uh, waiting on next steps on that. Well, I think, um, again, stating what I'm sure you are going to do, which is you can't look at this any longer as an independent effort. It needs to be put in the context of these others that we just talked about. And we should take very seriously what Dr. Kreider has just talked about. What we're winding up with is a gigantic consolidation of all of the children's healthcare in the, the, the Commonwealth under Boston Children's. And uh, there are gonna be significant cost and spending implications that we need to look consolidation between the Franciscan, the Tufts, the expansion of the outpatient and anything else that's in the works. So, um, I'm, I, I, 
I think we're going to have a serious discussion about this in the coming weeks and months. Absolutely. We, we look forward add. to bringing it back to you. Okay. S Stuart, if yes, I could just please. add, I, I think there's also the what's the impact on community hospitals as well, yes. um, I think a lot of the uh, coverage for pediatrics is provided by these, uh, at least by Tufts and I think Children's as well. And we're also seeing, you know, a lot of we we have seen historically uh, pediatric uh, practices being purchased uh, by Children's as well. So I was sort of wondering, what the is there a market left here? Um, so something to really uh, be considered as we look at these. Yes, very much so. All right. So, thank you so much, Sasha. This is quite a list of activities going on. David, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I know you have a research presentation. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Sasha. Um, and we wanted to really highlight some of those pediatric market changes for the exact uh, um, purpose of the discussion, which is to really highlight that we are actively engaging our experts, our consultants, our actuaries and economists to help answer some of the really important questions that commissioners raise. So as Sasha said, look forward to um, important conversations in the future. So for the next agenda item, I am going to uh, turn it over to our research team. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to present some new data to you. Uh, detailing some of the impacts of COVID-19 on healthcare utilization in the Commonwealth. Uh, so uh, to get right into it, I will turn it over to David Auerbach. Okay, thank you, David. Um, yeah, let's get right into it. And I'm gonna just say a few words and then pass it off to Laura Nasuti on my team and then she will hand off to Diana Vescones also on my team. Um, and so we're, I think this fits really nicely in the in the discussion today. It's kind of related to some of the earlier discussions around the benchmark, where we're trying to understand, <clears throat> have there been patterns of care that were disrupted and changed through the COVID pandemic that, that might actually be lasting? And does this have implications for, for the long run? Are there, some, are there permanent changes? Are there shifts in how people are using care? And one of our best windows into that possibility is the emergency department data. Um, and part of that is because we have it in such a timely manner. It's, it's some of the most up-to-date data we have. And that's really thanks to the hospitals for submitting that and Chia for processing it and sending it to us. So we have data through December of, of 2021, right to the end of the year on emergency department use. It's also comprehensive. It covers all ED visits in the entire state, um, covering all payers, all residents. Um, and it also, um, even more than perhaps the inpatient hospital inpatient visits. Uh, ED visits are very common. There's two and a half million roughly per year in Massachusetts. Um, in fact, about 10% more than per capita than the rest of the country. But it's such a common form of care and it's related to other forms of care. There's, uh, we've shown before, there's a high number of ED visits that are potentially avoidable that could sometimes you know, through better primary care or better access to other sites of care could have been avoided. And so it's related uh, very fundamentally to how people use care in the state. Um, and so um, I will be uh, introducing Laura and Sudi, who's going to give some of the background of this and then, uh, you know, walk through the top level of the data and then she's going to hand off to Diana. So um, with that, why don't you go ahead, Laura? Hello, good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you, David. Uh, we are gonna, as David mentioned, we are gonna provide an update and a deeper dive on emergency department use in Mass among Massachusetts residents today. Um, as David mentioned, one of the reasons we're, we're starting here, um, and this is part of our larger cost tr trends report uh, work looking at changes in utilization during COVID. One of the reasons we're starting here is because this discharge data set is, is one of our more comprehensive and most up-to-date data sets. Our prior work examined emergency department visits through September 2020 and found large decreases in the number of ED visits during the beginning of COVID that persisted um, to be over 20% below 2019 levels through September 2020. In that publication, we noted that some of the biggest drops were in potentially avoidable emergency department visits, and we will be spending more time 
on those visits in particular during this presentation. Uh, today, we will be looking at emergency data through 2021, and we will also share some commercial data from the All Payer Claims Database for 2018 through 2020 that will allow us to understand if residents were seeking care at other sites, such as offices or urgent cares, or if visits were down across all settings for that time period. So for the next slide, uh, this slide shows the overall trends in emergency department visits by month from January 2018 through December 2021. As you can see, by December 2021, ED visits are still below December 2019 levels. Uh, this is, they are down about 7% or almost 14,000 visits. Over this time period, we know that the experience of COVID across the nation varied. So we looked into a couple of publications, including CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report that has published on ED utilization using the National Syndromic Surveillance program data. We found that so far in publications out there, our Massachusetts experience follows a similar pattern to national ED utilization trends. Um, we, for, for this research, we are mostly going to be focusing on three distinct time periods for this presentation to really capture the impact of COVID. And so those um, are the highlighted gray boxes that you see on this graph. So we have March through September 2019 to capture utilization pre-COVID, March through September of 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic, in March through September of 2021. Next slide, please. This graph shows total emergency department visits in each year overall and then broken down by age group. 2019 is in blue, 2020 is in orange, and 2021 is in yellow. In the first set of bars, we can see that in 2021, ED visits, ED visits remain 12% below 2019 levels. And again, here we are looking at that March through September timeframe. So it, it is not the whole year. Um, when we break it down by age groups, we notice that this reduction was not uniform across age groups. The second set of bars are children's visits to the emergency department, and we can see there that in 2021, children were still experiencing a 23% decrease in ED visits ver compared to say the 65 and older age group, which was only seeing a 5% reduction in visits during that time period. So with, with understanding the overall trends, we're now gonna go break down these ED visits even further. So on the next slide, we see we see our uh, five categories. Um, and we will be looking at these five categories again by age groups. Um, we did this initially for our interim COVID report. So some of these categories may look familiar, but just as a refresher, the first category we group includes behavioral health visits. Behavioral health visits are ED visits with a primary behavioral health diagnosis, such as major depression. We, th we then group all COVID visits together where COVID in this case was the primary or secondary diagnosis and we create a bucket of COVID visits. We then take all remaining visits and run them through the revised billing, billings algorithm and separate them further into several categories that we group into injury visits. And this group would include trauma such as concussions and lacerations, our potentially avoidable visits, these are visits that have been deemed likely to be non-emergent visits and emergent but primary care treatable based on their diagnosis codes. And so may include things like flu or low back pain, things that would be better, that may be emergent but would be better probably treated at your primary care. Um, and finally, all other visits where emergency department, department care was needed, as well as visits that could not be classified. Some example diagnoses here include abdominal pain and chest pain. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Diana to show you uh, our, our ED vi visits by these categories and age groups. Great, thank you, Laura. 
Wonderful. So now continuing um, looking at those March through September time periods running from 2019 to 2021. Um, we see that um, all categories of ED visits declined during this time frame, with the largest declines for potentially avoidable as well as injury visits at 17% each. Next slide, please. And notably, uh, the decline in potentially avoidable ED visits uh, differed by age group. And among children, uh, potentially avoidable ED visits dropped by two thirds or nearly 60,000 visits um, in 2020 when compared to 2019. And by 2021, we're still a third below 2019 levels. Next slide, please. And so um, these next three slides, including this one, shows, um, again, those five categories of ED visits, but by age group. And we're looking here at um, those, the categories of ED visits for children aged 0 to 17. And we see um, that the decline for children in ED visits was greatest for those potentially avoidable visits. Um, while behavioral health ED visits declined the least between 2019 and 2021. And worth noting um, for behavioral health related ED visits that um, we do see higher rates of ED boarding nevertheless, and that the share of all pediatric ED visits that are behavioral health related did increase um, into 2021. Next slide, please. And um, staying with these five categories of ED visits, but now looking at those adults aged 18 to 64, we see that uh, between 2019 and 2021, potentially avoidable and injury ED visits declined the most for this age group at 17% and 16% respectively. Next slide, thank you. Um, and finally, um, looking between these age groups and specifically at those adults age 65 plus, we see that by 2021, um, ED visits approached 2019 levels for all categories um, with relatively small uh, declines in, in BH visits, all other visits and potentially avoidable visits. Next slide, please. Great. And so now we're gonna switch to looking at a subset of potentially avoidable ED visits, uh, specifically among children. And this subset includes um, ED visits for those highest volume diagnosis codes uh, that you see on the x-axis here. And um, among these highest volume primary diagnosis codes for children, we see that between 2019 and 2021, uh, visits declined for infection and illness-related diagnoses, such as vomiting and fever. Um, so um, when comparing 2019 to 2021, we do see a slight increase in visits among children for a primary diagnosis of cough. Next slide, please. And focusing on children for one more moment, um, we did see as well that potentially avoidable visits for flu among children nearly disappeared for the period of September 2020 to March 2021, um, coming in at a less than 50 um, flu visits among children um, during that time period compared to nearly 13,000 in the six months prior to the start of the pandemic. Next slide, please. And finally, um, just to zoom out a little bit and looking at the percent of all ED visits that are potentially avoidable, um, we do see that um, that drop in percent of ED visits that are potentially avoidable from 2019 to 2021 persists, or from 2019 to 2020 persists into 2021. And, um, particularly for those residents living in the lowest income areas, um, the percent of ED visits for that population that's potentially avoidable remained higher than for other residents in 2021. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Laura. Great, thank you, Diana. Uh, so 
we are going to do a bit of a transition here. The next couple of slides are going to look at our commercial claims data from the all payer claims database. I think this is the first time we're showing 2020 data from the all payer claims database. So uh, glad to be presenting it today. Um, so now instead of looking at six month periods, we are going to look at utilization rates for the different sites of service across the whole calendar year. In this graph, the blue bars are 2018 rates per 1,000 member months. The orange bars are 2019, and the yellow bars are 2020. Uh, we do not have 2021 commercial claims data just yet, so we are only able to look through, uh, through the end of the 2020 experience. And again, this is just commercial. Um, for this analysis, we, we also removed behavioral health therapy or counseling visits and focused on evaluation and management visits, also referred to as problem-based or sick visits, uh, to understand where, where those visit types in particular were, were going. Um, so for 2020, we see that all, all of these visits are down across that these visits are down across office, hospital, outpatient department, and emergency department sites compared to 2018 and 2019 levels. However, you can see that urgent care in the middle and telehealth are both saw increases in volume. Um, but I would like to note overall uh, the the overall utilization for these problem based visits we're still down across sites, all, all these sites on this slide by 10% in 2020 compared to 2019 for our commercial population. Um, so based on the particularly large drop in emergency department visits for children, we then took a look specifically at pediatric visits and found that the overall number of evaluation and management visits or those sick visits for children from October through December in 2020 dropped by 30% compared to that same time period or that same quarter in 2019. Again, I wanna highlight if you can see in the bars that the office, hospital, outpatient department and ED visits went down while telehealth went up. Urgent care actually remained at a similar level of 17, of 17 visits um, per 1,000 member months. Uh, but of course, this is going to make up a greater proportion of all pediatric problem-based visits uh, for the care received when, when we're seeing less visits overall. And so one of the next things we did was look specifically at urgent care because we realized that some people may have been user, utilizing the urgent care as, as opposed to the emergency department. So we wanted to dig in a little bit more there in particular. And so although um, these pediatric visits were down overall in 2020, um, we took this deeper dive to by examining five of the most common pediatric conditions. And here and in the last slide, what we're really trying to do is to understand did these emergency department visits move somewhere else? And we know from the overall utilization pattern that we're, we're still down these ENM sick visits um, in 2020. And then in particular, are we seeing any switching or potential for switching occurring between urgent cares and emergency departments? And so if we look at the first set of bars for acute pharyngitis, I'll, I'll walk you through this graph. So in the first set of bars in 2019, 9.3% of pediatric visits that for this condition that took, uh, took place in an urgent care center. But in 2020, that was up slightly at 9.8% 9 9 of all those visits. Over the same time period, we see that the percent that went to an emergency department stayed flat at a little less than 1%. So if you look across these top five conditions, acute pharyngitis, acute upper respiratory infection, cough, fever, and strep, uh, we see an increasing percentage of the total visits for those conditions to urgent care, total ambulatory visits for those to urgent care centers 
while we see similar or falling proportions of those visits going to emergency departments from 2019 to 2020. This indicates that there is perhaps some shifting of care occurring for these, these particular pediatric conditions. So the next slide, um, I, I do wanna say though, although much of the decrease in emergency department visits and shifts in care towards telehealth and urgent cares during this period are attribute, likely attributable to the pandemic, we know that there were also a lot of policy changes, particularly around telehealth, Another reason for some of this change in volume and shifts in care to a small percent may, may have to do with the change in the healthcare landscape. So notably, seven emergency department sites closed between 2019 and 2021, and we are not aware of any new emergency department sites opening. Uh, these, these seven emergency departments are represented by the orange Xs that are clustered mostly around the eastern part of the state on the map. Um, and these ED sites made up uh, approximately 3.5% of all the ED volume in 2018. So they, they represent about, they would have potentially represented about three, three and a half percent of the volume. In addition, during this time period, we actually saw 30 urgent cares open and 17 close. And so there was a net of 13 new ur urgent care sites opening during the sa same time period, including two sites that exclusively provide care for pediatric patients. Um, these, these sites, as you can see by the map, are in blue and they are a bit more spread out over, over the Commonwealth. Um, our next issue of data points is on, focuses on urgent care sites and will highlight these changes and provide more more details on these changes. So in conclusion, the number of emergency department visits in 2021 increased from 2020, but remained below pre-pandemic 2019 levels. While there were declines in all types of emergency department visits during this time period, behavioral health visits had the smallest declines while potentially avoidable ED visits saw the largest declines declines in all emergency department visits, but especially potentially avoidable, uh, were, were largest for children. We are seeing evidence that this decline may be due to small shifts of care into other care settings, including urgent care and telehealth, but this decline in emergency department visits is also likely driven by changes in care-seeking behavior and reduced transmission of non-COVID communicable diseases. We will continue to monitor these trends as new data become available to, to see if these patterns persist. So with that, thank you very much for your time and welcome any questions. Okay, very good. So can I ask our commissioners if they have any comments or questions? Yeah, that's Chris. Uh, sure. So yeah, this is great stuff. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you go back to slide 52 for a moment? Yeah. Um, and the uh, what's, what's really pretty striking here is, um, actually it wasn't this one. It might've been the, it was the, uh, or no, that's it, I guess. Go back to 52. Can we crosswalk the uh, telehealth? Um, you, you Do you have the, the telehealth data broken down by diagnosis? I do not have that at my fingertips. That is something we are working on um, as, and we can do a specific look at, at yeah, pediatric okay. diagnoses. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's so interesting that fever, um, you know, uh, per, persisted, went up uh, with, at, uh, with urgent care centers where, uh, in in twenty in nineteen and, and twenty, where uh, the uh, you know the other diagnoses did not, um, and a general comment on the data: it's great to get, uh, especially at this time of turmoil, to have a data that's only uh, three and a half months old. Um, 
and I, I, I would urge that we, we push Chia to, to give you, or maybe you are pushing Chia to give you access to, to uh, all the preliminary data. Um, you know, the, the acute care claims have not been fully adjudicated. So there's a lot of IBNR there, but all of the ambulatory stuff is done um, really through February. And, uh, you know, given some of the uh, complexity that we've been talking about for the last hour, I just think the sooner we have uh, uh, data with, a, with an asterisk on it, you could call it, um, you know, uh, preliminary, but it would give us more insight. This is, this is really helpful. Thank you. And I, I can say, I know Chia is definitely working hard on processing their um, all payer claims data as, as fast as they can with, with the, the period that you mentioned where we're hoping we're, we're, they're, they're having to wait to make sure that some of the claims are fully well, but, adjudicated. But let me push it that a little bit. Um, office visit procedures um, are, are no different in terms of their cleanliness uh, at this stage than uh, ER or urgent urgent care. That is that is done. There is no IBNR, or the, if there is, you're down to one one percent. So, um, I, you know, whatever you can get, but yeah. uh, earlier is better. Agree. We we are hoping that that with the EAPCD will allow us to get an earlier look at some of this data than we have been able to in the past, and that's it's it's getting close. It's getting close. Okay. Other com comments or questions? These are great reports. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Before we go on, uh, I failed to mention uh, after our discussion about the benchmark setting for 2023, that um, one of our commissioners, Don Berwick, could not be with us today. He is flying someplace in the mid-Atlantic right now on his way to uh, London. Uh, he did uh, issue a uh, fairly detailed set of comments. Uh, given the nature that he is not here, we could not read them because uh, it requires people to be present um, in order to participate in the discussion. We will, however, make his comments available. They will be in the public record and a copy will be sent to each of the commissioners. I assume most of you have had a chance to read them. So uh, I just want the record to show that we did receive this these comments from uh, Dr. Berwick, and they will be part of the public record. Uh, thank you. Okay, with that said, um, we're now gonna move on, uh, David uh, Seltz, to discuss our certification program, which has been part of our effort almost from the beginning to establish certifications for accountable care organizations. And I'm very anxious to get an update on how we're doing. Well, we are very anxious to give the commission an update on this uh, important program and the, the next year of certification, which we've called uh, the leap year. So I am gonna turn it right over to Michael Stanek, who is the senior manager on our healthcare um, transformation and innovation team, who is going to give you some an update. David, and some... Uh, David excuse me, oh, I didn't sorry. see, I just saw that David Cutler did you, David? Did you have a comment on the previous discussion? Well, well I did, just because I was I was processing the previous discussion, oh. but I just wanted to, which was phenomenal. I just wanted to suggest to David Auerbach and the team there, there's a really important issue here, which is is the telehealth substituting for other more expensive types of visits, and um, if it is, that then we should really want to make the legislature be aware of that. And, and, and insurers and mass health and everyone be aware of that as soon as possible because that would argue for really increasing the use of it. If it's not, that doesn't mean it's bad, but just like that, that specific question is important for both state policy and national policy. And like the HPC is one of the very few organizations in the country that can actually look at that. So just to keep working on that particular question. Absolutely. In fact, we separately we uh, we do have a telehealth a mandated uh, telehealth report that we are 
in the middle of that'll be sharing some of the same APCD data that uh, Laura showed a window of. So absolutely. All right. Sorry, I didn't. I my my screen here at corporate headquarters doesn't show everyone at the right time. <laughs> okay, with that said, I'm going to turn it back to David Sells. I'm going to turn it right over to Michael Stanek. Take it away. Thank you, Director Seltz. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm happy to be here today to provide an update on the HBC's Accountable Care Organization Certification Program. We've been hard at work the past few months reviewing applications under our newly updated standards, which you'll recall we're calling the Learning Equity and Patient Centeredness, or LEAP, criteria. I'm very pleased to be able to announce today that all 14 ACOs that applied for recertification have met the LEAP certification criteria. And you can see here they are Atrius Health, Baycare Health Partners, Beth Israel Leahy Health Performance Network, BMC Health System, Cambridge Health Alliance, Children's Medical Center, Corporate, Medical Center Corporation, Community Care Cooperative, Mass General Brigham, Reliant Medical Group, Signature Healthcare, South Coast Health System, Steward Healthcare Network, Trinity Health of New England, and Wellforce, um, which during the process has changed its name to Tufts Medicine. Each of these certified ACOs was previously certified by the HBC at the end of 2019. Um, one exception or note that I would make is that Trinity Health of New England is a new certified ACO this year, taking the place of the Mercy Hospital, which was a certified ACO in the last cycle. The Mercy Hospital is part of the Trinity Health of New England system, so this update just reflects some internal organizational changes there in the past few years. This marks the third cycle of ACO certifications since the program launched in 2017. We added some flexibility to our application deadline last year in acknowledgement of the challenges posed by the ongoing public health situation. We offered an extended window for application submissions, which shifted back our customary review period and this public announcement by a few months. So while these certifications are two-year certifications, they are effective until the end of calendar year 2023. Notably, this was the first time we made substantive changes to the certification program standards. Building on what we had in place before, we reoriented the standards a bit to embrace the ACO model as a catalyst for learning and improvement among healthcare organizations and recognize the role ACOs can play in advancing health equity in the Commonwealth. ACOs receiving this recognition under the LEAP standards have met a set of objective criteria focused on core ACO capabilities, demonstrating dedication to patient-centered care, use of evidence-based and data-driven strategies to improve care delivery, and commitment to addressing long-standing health inequities. As a reminder, the current total number of HPC certified ACOs is 16. In addition to the 14 ACOs we are recertifying, two additional HPC certified ACOs are eligible for recertification later this year. And these are Health Collaborative Berkshires, which is a partnership that includes Berkshire Health Systems and Community Health Programs, and Merrimack Valley ACO, which is a collaboration including Lawrence General Hospital and Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. We really wanna congratulate and thank all of these organizations for their partnership through this process, and most importantly, the dedication that they've shown to providing high quality, efficient healthcare to their patients. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little about some very high level observations and reflections on what we saw in the ACO applications this year. Our next step with this program will be to begin analyzing some of the key information that we learned from these ACOs applications and developing some outputs for sharing with you commissioners and the public in general. So this is a very preliminary look. As a reminder, one of our goals with the LEAP standards was to provide more flexibility to ACOs, offering them multiple ways to demonstrate how the ACO meets the spirit and the letter of our standards. We wanted to ensure that certification allows for a variety of ACO approaches and innovations within the framework that we set forth in recognition of the fact that we're all still learning how to get healthcare transformation right. So moving into our certification criteria, our standards require the ACOs to systematically monitor and assess the experience, perspectives, and or preferences of the patient populations they serve. And they require that the information so gathered is used to inform the ACO strategy, or organization level initiatives for improving patient experience. There are multiple ways that the certified ACOs are interfacing with their patient populations. For instance, many make use of patient and family advisory councils, but it's probably not surprising that the primary mechanism ACOs showed us in their applications were periodic patient experience surveys. We saw a bit of how that data is compiled, analyzed, and put to use. 
We've seen these analyses used by the certified ACOs to inform broad strategic plans. We've seen them used to help design or focus staff training opportunities around improving the patient experience. And particularly given the events of the past two years, we saw some of the ACOs using this information to try to improve the telehealth experience for their patients. We also require ACOs to demonstrate a culture of performance improvement, a term we use broadly to understand a variety of potential ways these organizations are creating mechanisms for building, embedding, and advancing cross ACO commitments to improving performance on things like cost, quality, and patient experience. We saw a range of responses to this criterion. For example, some of the ACOs have implemented formal process improvement methodologies, and several pointed to the internal financial incentives for groups or clinicians that they used to hold them to the ACO's performance goals. But the most common response elements revolved around the engagement of ACO leadership in tracking and reviewing performance and or the periodic convening of clinical and business leaders from around the ACO to focus on opportunities for improving the performance of the ACO. Next slide, please. In line with the focus of the LEAP standards on organizational capacity for learning and improvement, the standards consider the processes and tools that ACOs are using to share information with and offer feedback to clinicians. The standards also require that ACOs work to decrease provider practice variation, support evidence-based practices, and facilitate learning among providers to ensure that they can make the best decisions possible at the point of care. Among the certified ACOs, we saw a variety of examples of how these organizations make available evidence-based protocols or disseminate guidelines or relevant clinical vignettes. Some have entire internal teams dedicated to developing and disseminating up-to-date information on evidence-based medicine. The certified ACOs are also developing or making available a variety of clinical decision support tools, as well as designing and offering clinicians structured learning opportunities. As they have since the inception of the program, the certification standards also require that ACOs collect data to understand the health needs of their patient populations, perform appropriate risk stratification, and then use that data to design and implement one or more patient-facing population health management programs. We were particularly interested this year in understanding the targets and measures that ACOs use to gauge the impact of these programs in support of continuous improvement over time. The certified ACOs reported to us on a variety of population health management programs, 64 in total across the cohort. Perhaps not surprisingly, these included many examples of care management or care coordination programs, along with transitions of care programs for vulnerable patients moving between care settings or back into their homes. These programs are using a variety of measures and targets to gauge success, with specific targets around lowering hospital readmissions or reducing avoidable inpatient or emergency department visits being common. To understand how ACOs are iterating and working to improve over time, we also asked ACOs to describe any recent programmatic changes implemented based on missed targets or other performance considerations. And we did see a fair number of such changes, including changes to program staffing, workflows, or resource allocation. Next slide, please. The LEAP standards also require a whole person focus. ACOs must be advancing the integration of behavioral health care into primary care settings with respect to workforce, administration, clinical operations, and or funding. Again, here the standards require that the ACO sets and measures progress on discrete goals for further increasing integration over time. We saw that the certified ACOs are proceeding from a range of starting points with respect to behavioral health integration, but all are working to create more robust linkages between primary care and behavioral health whether that be through increasing physical or virtual co-location, facilitating better information sharing, or otherwise supporting better communication and more seamless handoffs within and beyond the ACO. This criterion also requires that ACOs be advancing efforts to understand and address patients' health-related social needs through screenings and referral relationships with community-based or social service organizations. And again, we saw the certified ACOs have stood up such efforts many building outward from approaches initially focused on their mass health populations to incorporate more populations on a multi-payer basis. Finally, as I've highlighted throughout, a pillar this year of the certification program was its emphasis on learning, both for the ACO and for us at the HBC. One area in particular where we're all certainly still learning is around health equity, exploring how ACOs can increasingly build a health equity lens into the fundamentals of their organizations and care delivery models. We saw a number of initiatives to improve health equity, 
many focused on the immediate needs of the pandemic response, but others exploring longer term strategies to close quality gaps or leverage existing population health management approaches. Most of these initiatives represent an early phase of these organizations work on improving health equity. Across the certified ACOs, we saw foundations to build off of, and certainly as a Commonwealth, we all have a long way to go in continuing to advance health equity. So we look forward to continuing to engage with the ACOs on this topic. One thing we'll do is to provide some reflections back to the full cohort of certified ACOs around what we saw in the health equity responses, areas of opportunity in the future, and potential progress the HB, HBC would love to see in this area in the coming years. Next slide, please. Lastly, we wanted to share some additional observations from the 14 applications we reviewed over the last few months. In addition to the information collected as part of the assessment criteria I just described, we also collect some additional information in the application, some of it in the form of structured supplemental information questions. We collect information on risk contracts held by the ACOs as part of our application. And we do continue to see that the ACOs hold quite a few risk contracts, most of them commercial, but with a number of Medicare and MassHealth ACO contracts as well. Collectively, these risk contracts enroll about 2.8 million base daters. The overwhelming majority of those lives are in contracts that have downside risk for the ACO. We asked the ACO some questions this year around steps that they're taking to promote equity, both within their ACOs and within their care delivery models. And we asked about their digital health and telehealth strategies. We also gave the ACOs an opportunity to identify what they believe have been their most successful strategies so far for controlling TME growth and the biggest challenges they face in controlling TME growth. You can see here that with respect to equity, ACOs organizational efforts so far have tended to focus on training for their staffs, recruitment strategies, quality improvement initiatives, and expansions of access to telehealth services. More generally with respect to telehealth, the most common supports that ACOs are offering for telehealth include interpreter services, a common technology platform for their providers, and technical assistance to their providers in using technology. And when it comes to ACOs digital health strategies, the most common elements are patient portals, virtual visits, remote patient monitoring, and e-consults between primary care providers and specialists. As I mentioned, we asked each of the ACOs to identify their top three most successful strategies for reducing TME growth and the top three challenges they experience in controlling TME growth. When we tallied those up, we found that the most commonly cited successful strategies were complex care management programs, approaches ACOs are using to reduce avoidable inpatient or post-acute care utilization, and investments the ACOs are making in primary care and behavioral health capacity. The most commonly cited challenges were price growth for drugs, medical supplies, or other inputs, the difficulty ACOs face in translating risk contract incentives into incentives for their clinicians, and the prices of providers outside of their ACO. As I mentioned earlier, in the coming weeks, we will be analyzing the data and information submitted during the recently concluded round of certifications to inform future outputs. For instance, we may look to see if there are any notable differences in the responses from physician-led ACOs versus hospital-anchored ACOs, or those ACOs that manage all risk contracts through a single organizational structure versus those operating through multiple such structures. One final reminder I wanted to touch on, with limited exceptions, the information collected by the HBC through this process is held confidential. The HBC will not disclose at the individual ACO level without the consent of that ACO, non-public information and documents submitted for certification that are clinical, financial, strategic, or operational in nature. However, we may discuss and report on certified ACOs using aggregate or non-attributed information. With that, I will conclude and I'm happy to take any questions. And I'd also love to hear if you commissioners have any suggestions for analyses we might want to attempt or learning and dissemination outputs we might consider. Thank you. Again, are there any questions or comments? Very helpful. Well, I'm so glad to see that we've really continued to, to, to move this program forward. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from anyone? Good, keep it up. All right, David. Uh, your turn to give us the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, uh, Mike Stanek, 
Um, more to come on, on that program. Um, and I hope to return to the uh, Care Delivery Transformation Committee for further conversations as we uh, get our learnings uh, and lessons learned from this round of certification. So just uh, a few things left on the agenda for today. Um, first, just want to highlight uh, that we are continuing to release a number of really important reports and research items and profiles of our investment programs. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, a tremendous amount of work already this calendar year that the HPC has released. Uh, we'll give a, a, a shout to our data points issue number 22 about growth in out-of-pocket spending for pregnancy delivery and postpartum care in Massachusetts, which um, has received a tremendous amount of attention uh, in, in the media um, and by interested stakeholders. Uh, so uh, our, our, our work here is really contributing to a larger conversation. On the right-hand side, you can see a long list of additional things that we are working on. Um, and hope to release in the coming weeks and months, um, including, as was mentioned earlier, uh, an additional data points on the growth in alternative care sites or urgent care centers in Massachusetts, and a number of, of profiles from some of our investment programs. So uh, a lot of work uh, going on here at the HPC. Um, happy and excited to share this all this with you as we release it. Um, and then finally, one piece of, of just business for the HPC. Uh, so as you know, the HPC does uh, work with a number of consultants and experts in uh, fields such as economics, actuarial science, accounting, care delivery improvement, and quality measurement for a whole range of activities at the HPC. And early on uh, in our development, recognizing that there is um, some unpredictability in when we receive uh, material change notices or are otherwise asked to uh, review market uh, changes, um, the bylaws were established such that the executive director uh, can enter into contracts with these experts up to $500,000 and that board approval would be required again for contracts valued at more than $500,000. So as the end of our fiscal year approaches, um, I do anticipate exceeding that threshold for one of our contracts, and I'm seeking your approval and authorization today to extend beyond that amount. And this contract is for our primary team of expert economic consultants assisting with our market oversight projects this year. As you heard earlier from Sasha, there is a tremendous amount of activity uh, in our market right now, uh, and we have been um, uh, really hard at work in, in being able to analyze and provide information to the public around the impacts of all of these really important changes, including the, uh, an unprecedented number of MCN reviews, the DON applications, uh, the changes in the pediatric market that we discussed earlier. And much of this work is still ongoing. So I am requesting um, your approval to um, be able to increase the contract uh, for this consultant. And I would just emphasize that this is not net new money. This is uh, really just shifting money uh, that is otherwise unspent uh, into this contract. And so will not require um, an increase to our overall budget, but really an authorization to increase this one contract. You can see on the next slide uh, the vote language for this uh, request. Happy to answer any questions about this. Well, I know how hard that group has worked and, and I anticipate they're gonna continue to be very involved with us given that the amount of activity that's going on in this state is actually accelerating in many respects. And, we just talked about this with respect to the massive consolidation in the children's healthcare world. So um, are there any comments? If not, we yeah, will- Actually, one question, uh, Stuart. Uh, sure, David, when is, uh, when is uh, the in the cycle, do we look at the overall budget? It's, you know, it'd be useful to see this in the context of, uh, of our overall budget. Well, once a year, we review in detail uh, the budget. Uh, yeah, my question is, when, when is that cycle? Yeah, when, huh? when are we, where are we in that cycle? 
So we um, actually, the House uh, of Representatives, I think, just released their budget proposal today, uh, which will include you know, a line item for the Health Policy Commission. Um, we typically uh, let the budget, state budget process play out so that we know what our total allocation is uh, through the budget and then meet as a group and a commission uh, to ensure that um, review our internal budget and how we allocate that funding to our different uh, categories, including you know, payroll versus contracted services, uh, et cetera. So that uh, typically happens at the July board meeting. Cool. Is that okay, Chris? Uh, David Cutler? Thank you. Um, so I know one of the things my fellow commissioners look to me for is to just to make sure about some of the more technical aspects and, you know, are we doing a good job with them, an appropriate job with them. So I'll just sort of relay to the fellow commissioners that my fellow commissioners that the things that these organizations do are extremely technical and very, very complicated. So it's not even like, you know, any doctor could do it. It's like this is sort of the equivalent of specialized brain surgery. And if you need to do specialized brain surgery, you really, really should have a brain surgeon doing it for you. And so we, we're involved with them, but I just, I, I don't look at these and say, oh, we should be doing this in-house because this is just, you know, you, you, you just don't wanna be in that operating room unless you really absolutely know what you're doing here. And, and, and so, so this is an area of expertise that I think it's worth contracting out for. Thank okay, uh, any other questions or comments? Move the motion. All right, motion has been put forth. Is there a second? Second. All right, mm -hmm. Colleen. All right, last one of the day, Mr. Chair. All right, I support the motion. And Vice Chair Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Blakeney? Aye. Commissioner Cutler? Aye. Commissioner Foley? Aye. Commissioner Haupt? Aye. Commissioner Kreider? Aye. Commissioner Master Giovanni? Aye. Under Secretary Peters? Aye. And Commissioner Roeder? Aye. Thank you very much. Right. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. It's unanimous, David. Keep it up. All right. As we bring this to a close, before I do that, first of all, are there any issues that anybody wants to bring up? Um, this was a very important meeting. Um, I think we touched on some critical issues. Clearly, we have a number more to deal with. Um, as I just said, the complexity of our healthcare system is not getting any easier, that's for sure. What's also interesting is how much, uh, I, uh, how much the rest of the country is looking at what we're doing um so i we're on a we, we may be we're under a bit of a microscope when it comes to our activities so uh, but i'm sure we'll all live up to it anyway uh any further comments if not i just want to remind people um a couple of things first of all uh not only to the commissioners but to the public that our slides will be available on our website for, that came from this discussion. Um, and uh, the, there's also a recording of the video um, of the meeting, which uh, you can get on YouTube. Um, uh, the next schedule meetings uh, of our uh, subcommittees will be on May 11th. Uh, there'll be a meeting at 9.30. Uh, and one at 11. Again, the meetings will be held virtually and will be available on YouTube. And uh, I more than welcome uh, the public uh, to review all the activities of the Health Policy Commission um, on our website. So unless I hear anything to the contrary, do I see I not Colleen, are there any hands up that I'm missing? I don't see any hands, no. All right. I will accept a motion to adjourn. I see that motion. Second. All right. 